Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to Curious Coaches Club. It's a bit weird being on a Friday. Uh, it's kind of thrown me a little bit because it's been the normal Monday slot that we've done. Uh, well, I mean, forever now, it seems like. And flipping it across to a Friday because we're in our UK coaching week. Um, somewhat thrown me a bit, but it's exciting to be here today. And this is a great topic for us. Uh, it's one that is always close to many coaches' hearts for many positive reasons and at times for some challenging reasons. But ultimately, working with parents is a really important part of the coaching experience. As always with today's show, there will be communities of practice that you can get involved within. There will be connected coaches where we'll continue the conversations and the thread and discussions over there. So any kind of further questions that you might have for Robin, for Jen or for Heather, we can always get involved and pick them up there as well. So um, let's get introductions from the guests. Let's start with you, Robin, as you're first on my list as I move left to right. Just give us a little bit, uh, a one-liner that describes you as a person. So not your job. I, I want to know you as a person. So Jen and Heather, you've got slightly advanced warning that this is coming your way now. So I'm putting Robin on the spot. So one line on you. Okay. Um, an inquisitive practitioner um, who enjoys trying to you know, optimise what I do as a, as a sports coach. Um, I suppose that's probably quite sporty, but yeah, I, like, I suppose it's that cliche, a uh, constant learner. Okay, very good. Excellent. And what do you do for a day job? Uh, so I'm a senior lecturer in coaching and performance at the University of Central Lancashire, and I work as a head coach on the England hockey pa uh, player pathway. Wonderful. Um, Heather Douglas, a lady that needs no introduction, but give us your one liner. Who are you? Goodness, no, I would wonder if I were to return that to you, Nick, and what would you say about me? Um, <laughs> the first thing that springs to mind is um, I work hard, but I play harder. Very nice. Um, of course, I would have said exactly the same. And what 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 do you do uh, around that then kind of in your sporting slash parenting life? Well, um, my my two full time jobs, one for UK coaching as policy manager and my other full time job is a mother of four boys. So there's quite a, a tricky task there to balance the two. I can imagine uh, almost third one is a referee. I can imagine in your house on a fairly uh, uh, yeah, regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. You know that one child makes you a parent, two children makes you a referee. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and Jen, so what's your what's your one liner? How would you describe yourself? Who are you? Um, I'd say probably um, fairly active, physically active, and socially active, and just hit sixty, so just trying to enjoy life. <laughs> Very nice. Oh. Very nice. And um, what 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 other stuff do you do? Why are you here, for example? So I'm a mother of three. All three um, actually play sports so I've got a grassroots one an Olympian one and a professional rugby one um and why am I, why am I here because you asked me Lily bullies me into it so there's no choice mum get on this <laughs> okay so uh, so and Lily is the hockey player yeah yeah okay yeah Cool. All right. So um, that gives a, a, a bit of an idea on um, on who we're dealing with today, which is awesome for all the coaches listening. And this is a real opportunity to make sure that as coaches listening, any questions that you may have for uh, the uh, the guests that we've got on the, on the show today, feel free to pop them into the chat box. We will try and make sure we pick up these as we go through. And what we have there is the plan for the day. So we're going to start to explore, well, why are relationships between parents and coaches important? And I'm going to say from the outset, this is not a session that is about bashing the negative side of parents. Um, we've all been involved in sport and coaching 
for many years. And what I would all, always say from the topic around parents is it's always the loud minority that get the bad press. The majority of parents involved in uh, youth sport and involved in adult sport, because lots of parents still go to watch their kids, even though they might be grown up. Um, the majority of parents are fantastic. So this is definitely not a session about that. But the relationship between coaches and parents is an important one, but sometimes fraught with some challenges. So we'll start to explore that. Then we'll get into how we develop it and then what the positive coaching environments are for parents and coaches. But importantly, it's those takeaway messages that we can, we can uh, steal from the conversations that we can go, oh, right, I'm going to start to think about that and consider how we use that. So, Robin, we're going to get into to your view of the world first. Tell us a little bit on why you think these kind of relationships are so important. Yeah, so uh, I think there's sort of, there's definitely three sort of overarching uh, themes that we can consider when we look at the, the parent relationship with the athlete, but also uh, the parent relationship with the coach. So broadly speaking, we're looking at things like how they support the athlete. So supporting the athlete, understanding the athlete and, and developing the athlete are probably three good ways to maybe start to dissect some of the, some of the multi faceted ways that parents can help, um, both coach and athlete. So when we think about their, their supporting the athlete role, I mean, maybe it's sort of a, a sort of a surface level of the stuff we're quite sort of familiar with in terms of, you know, bringing athletes to and from environments, resourcing, financing, food, time commitments. Um, all those elements, you know, becoming actively involved in the working community. Those are all sort of key roles that parents play around supporting the athlete more generally. So sort of from the top um, in terms of across their athletes um, time in sport. And I suppose I use athlete quite uh, interchangeably between sort of from grassroots foundation all the way up to performance. It's not necessarily a, a pinned in area. Um, the second one I'd talk about is probably the how athletes can help, uh, sorry, parents can help coaches understand the athlete. So, you know, there's, there can be a very, very important source of information for, for us as coaches and um, for us sort of understanding the, the specifics around their athlete, um, particularly when it comes to things around, you know, athlete welfare has been a big one. Um, I've experienced that quite a lot as, a, as an active coach. You know, parents sort of giving me snippets of information that the, the player probably never would want to do for whatever reason, whether that's the dynamic coach sort of athlete relationship, their position in the system, if they think it's going to go against them for selection or, or you know, that, you know, whether they're a young person who just doesn't want to demonstrate that sort of, that sort of element of their personality. But actually, parents can help us piece together some of the missing elements that we don't see necessarily. Um, they can engage with them far more than we do. So as parents, you know, they can really sort of engage, particularly between the sort of formal coaching and playing environment and that informal environment, considering how much time most sports and most coaches have access to their players. It's, it's minimal in comparison to how much time a parent will spend with their, with their child during sort of the rest of the week. So, you know, acknowledging that they are they are very influential in that respect because of that amount of time they spend is, is an important one and can help us understand but also bridge that gap between what we do and what we're trying to do in terms of developing the child more holistically but also depending on the environment the uh, developing a the performer they also give us an insight into their relationships you know um both heather and jennifer have mentioned uh, the sibling element you know having you know, brothers and sisters that are playing sports at different and similar levels, you know, their, their insights for us as coaches that can allow us to start to tap into how we can work with uh, individual sort of athletes. For example, the sibling element is a, is a really fascinating one because we can, we can tip into how different relationships can develop different elements and have different characteristics. Um, but we won't get into that, but that's another sort of area of interest. And I suppose the third area I'd look at is, is particularly in a with the child at the center or the athlete at the center, this is how we develop that person to be, you know, the best person they can be, whether that's, you know, following multiple pathways, whether that's just being, you know, in terms of a participant who's going to go and influence other areas of life, you know, their schooling, their social life, and um, their career progression, or whether they are going to go and perform at the highest level. The, the role of parents and coaches can really help us sort of impact on the, the sort of psychosocial, the, the above the neck sort of learning that we can do with our athletes 
um, so they can help us link between that form and form environment. And they, we hear a lot about the types of questions we should ask or we should encourage parents to ask kids um, to help them sort of understand, interpret sporting experiences, the role modeling element in terms of you know how uh, parents can sort of help young children sort of understand the ways you should respond to certain things, whether that's you know on the sideline, yeah. winning, you know, being selected, deselected. And they can be really influential in that. And and also, you know, recognizing when their role might change, which I think is a crucial one. Um, and both Heather and Jennifer have talked about multiple different sort of levels that their children are performing at and maybe how those the sort of role a parent picks up changes between levels, but also Yeah, just... absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm interested to hear kind of you know, Jennifer and uh and Heather's experiences around the uh the role, you know, so you have a big role away from sport and start, you know, you know your children better than anybody else. What are your experiences, Jen and Heather, of um, of coaches starting to engage with you to learn more from you about the people that they're working with, about your kids? Shall I go? <laughs> yeah, go for it. But I think mine's it's interesting because I was just speaking to Freddie just before I came on and actually Lily sent me a list of stuff, but um, I don't think I had much relationship with the coaches in um, for all three of them, particularly because they didn't particularly want me to. Um, and the kids or the coaches? The kids. Okay. The, um, and especially they they had they were both and um, they're all into athletics. So there's a slight difference to athletics. Single there there was more influence there than hockey and the two girls playing hockey and Fred's playing rugby. Um, they. I think once they got into uh, team sport, they were happy with what was going on. And I just took a back seat, to be quite honest, you know, with the athletics, it was more, it was different because they all did that when they were younger and you have to drive to places. So most of it was just transport, turning up, watching it. Um, and then I didn't, you know, didn't really feel it was my role or job to talk to the coaches or ask to do anything. So I took quite a back stage role actually so um and obviously there are things that when they're upset or they talk about you know they haven't been selected or something like that then um i kind of just played it down it's just like it's not the most important thing in the world or you know we had other things um and i just didn't feel it was my role to um take the coach's job there's a coach's role and there's a parent role and mine was different to the coaches so um we kind of downplayed it lily, lily was that's one thing lily said is that you kind of um, minimise any, you know, ups or downs, the highs and the lows, you kind of normalise everything. So that's what we did. But athletics was slightly different that we've had um, with two of them, a good and a bad experience, but good with Lily, her coach has, they spend more time with them, athletics. It's very, very different to um, team sports, I felt. Um, and it was very positive the way the coach dealt with them. Um, and Fred actually had a poor experience where the coach wasn't quite so professional. Uh, that's my experience. Okay, brilliant. Um, I mean, there's loads we can put into that as well. Just even um, uh, individual kids may want different things. So th there's definitely not a uh, a one size fits all approach. So you know, your your children are quite happy that you know you're away and you're just doing the things to make their experience happen. Um, I had a conversation with. Uh, an England football player played a hundred times for her country, and she said that her dad had travelled the world watching her play, and not once did the head coach have a conversation with her dad. And you know, it, it was that feeling of belonging and part of something, but the coach just kept everybody at a distance, even though she was an England senior international. But she still wanted that engagement with her parent and. Uh, the first people that most phone after a game, most most kids will speak to, or most athletes as they, if they're growing up, they'll speak to their parents because they want some input and, and discussion. So, yeah, it's definitely not one size fits all and linear there. Heather, what are some of your experiences? Oh, have we lost Heather? No. Are you there, Heather, or have we lost you? Okay, we'll 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 come back to Heather in a Actually, second. No, I'm. Oh, are you there? I... 
Go, go for it. Oh, she's got the little yellow cross. We'll try and sort that out now. children from when they were very young ages we kind of grew up in a, a community where so their dads would know me and my husband and the kids from we were all really close at heart depth children it was just a conversation in a friendly way about how they're doing and, and at that level that was enough for me and I think like Jen I, I would I'm a I'm a parent that that does the driving does the dropping off and watches and all my children want is for their parents to see them play it doesn't need to be you know any other real interaction there and these have been the good experiences maybe later in the afternoon when we come into some maybe the negative experiences I've had I can elaborate on some of the, the strategies that I've used there. Mm. And, and was that the same for all four of the of the boys? Did they they all want the same from you or did they want different things from you at different times? To be honest, that, that's it, that their, their motivation was to play with their friends. And as long as me or my husband were watching them, clearly we can't watch all of them all of the time because they all play at the same time. So uh, some turn up early and some turn up late. So we need to manage all of that. But they're just happy if, if we see them, you know, that, that they see us watching them. Mm, yeah, great. Robin, tell us a little bit more about kind of how some of those collaborative approaches have taken place within your experiences. How have you kind of gone about developing some of those? Because clearly this communication, whilst it might not always happen, but could be helpful for the coach. Yeah, I think, um... It's, it's really important to try and gauge that fairly early on and, and not sort of, um, you see lots of models that sort of box parents up into different types. And I think that's, uh, it's unfair and unjust because actually, depending on lots of different reasons, they might float across them or they might be in certain ones. But I think it's nice to give them, um, I work in a talent environment. So for my context, it's very much about giving them an overview of what their child is there for and where they're going, but then almost allowing it to initially sort of evolve quite organically in terms of some parents will make steps and they will come and talk to you and you will gauge information from those actions and behaviours quite early on. Um, and then you can start to work with parents in sort of slightly different manners. So I think um, it, it all comes down to, like I said, it's about optimising that athlete's sort of progression and if they're really happy at a certain stage where mum or dad is just playing a, a role that's sort of fairly sort of passive in terms of um, the, the sort of development element and just being there supporting. And that's absolutely great, isn't it? It's, it's when kids might want to different things and, and how we as coaches adapt to that. And I think historically, there's been lots of initiatives that try and sort of separate parents and coaches, um, you know, and things like that. And when you hear lots of dialogues that sort of encourage parents, coaches to sort of separate parents. But actually, in recent years, we've tried to sort of blur that line a little bit and sort of acknowledge this we can work with parents and that might look different that might not actually physically take much work mm. but, but some parents you might do a lot of work because they really sort of want to they're sort of in that environment and they want to help or they want to help in that way or their child might want them to help them out. I suppose the challenge always comes is balancing between the the parent sort of belief and the child belief and trying to align you know, like we've talked, like been talked about by Heather and Jennifer, what the parent and the child want, and do they align? There's a challenge to come when a, the child wants that sort of engagement and the parent doesn't, or vice versa, the child wants that sort of freedom and the parents really engaged. So for me, it's key to try and align the sort of desires of both sides of that with us at some point. Yeah, great. Jen, did you ever have conversations with the kids, and same for you, Heather, about how they wanted you to engage in their sport with them? No, <laughs> no. Um, it, it was interesting um, what Robin was saying, because one of the things I was thinking back is that quite often um, the hockey or the, um, or the rugby in particular, they we would have a coaches would call a meeting for parents and outline what's going on, what might be their philosophy, what their expectations. And I think that was probably a good thing because 
we do want to know. Um, but I think like Heather, mostly the kids just want us to see them play. But I think if you've if you've also been given that information at the beginning, you know, this is the setup, this is what we believe in, this is my philosophy of game. Um, that's probably been really good when we've had those, and that's just the coaches and the parents away from the um the children, if I call them children now. But um yeah, so I think if it's set out like that, that's quite a good, that was always a good thing. So you you know, um and then I think approach the, the only time we see the coaches usually is after a match and that tends to be, I just think, such an emotional time because sports emotional, you you know, I don't think it would be a good thing to talk to them then. But if they set a time to say there will be a time for parents to speak or we're setting this up, that to me was a, a good way of um, approaching it. Yeah, I think what you've shown there is, is a level of, of, of self-awareness about the coach and what they're probably likely to be going through at that stage right at the back of a uh, back end of a game that uh, that many parents probably wouldn't consider um and would often use that opportunity when they're equally heightened with emotion um to go and have a conversation that may not go too well no. yeah heather have you seen many of them those kind of experiences yes unfortunately um i think I'm, I'm probably biased because of the upbringing I've had and the jobs that I do and I try to be not critical of anything that I see and try not to stand on the sideline like an assessor <laughs> of coaching practice. It's really, you know, and, I, I, you know, everything that I have seen, the majority of what I've seen has been fantastic. But there ha has been two instances when I've actually moved two of my children from, from a club because the, the behaviours of the coach was appalling. Um, basically built a team around his own son and the rest of the players were just commodities to to keep keep the team winning and it was the shouting of the coach rather than the shouting of the parents so two of the other dads actually uh said i'm we're willing to take to take a team away a different team and set them up and i was all for it because of the environment i found myself in i was just cringing all the time to the to the extent that once the coach was so rowdy that the opposition team who were nine years old left the pitch of their own accord so that that's the extreme level that i've been involved with luckily all four of them now are in in brilliant clubs and having a great time but yeah i'm conscious um whether it's a conscious decision or a subconscious decision not to speak to the coach immediately after the game because they want to have the downtime of the team talk or whatever with the children and they need to probably count to 10 as well sometimes just based on their own experiences so we usually have communications uh, in grassroots land in the clubhouse with a pint <laughs> at the beginning of the season or midway through the season or at the award ceremony at the end of the season okay and, and limited dialogue other than that well, it's conversational dialogue. It's not really in-depth um, kind of analysis of the game or anything like that. It's just, uh, oh, Harry had a great game today. Or did Oscar get a, have a late night last night? That level, you know, to, the gig kind of gauges the mood of their performance. So that's yeah, sure. Thing. Okay, cool. Um, uh, one of the things I find interesting is, is again, it, it comes down to that kind of relationship piece. Is how coaches can work with parents to. To understand the impact of their coaching and that's sometimes the challenge i think even regardless of whether it's grassroots or talent pathway or wherever you might be i think there's there's definitely an opportunity to learn more about how the coaching is landing um have, have any of you guys either general heather as, as parents and robin as a coach have you ever been asked or asked in your case robin parents view on the coaching that your either kids are receiving or that you're delivering robin have you asked from a from a coach's perspective yeah i think not necessarily directly about the coaching but more about the environment I think. okay I think a bigger a bigger understanding of you know particularly in the talent environment i work in we have the, the key one is that a lot of our parents travel considerable distance to get that to, prior to the to the environment um, and it's important to make sure those, those players are comfortable and but also in our environment stretched appropriately um so conversations with, with parents around that 
um, is interesting and it's something I do depending on the, the way the parent engages. And I think that fits in nicely. Jennifer talked about the, the opening uh, the environment I give in terms of a presentation about coaching styles. I think that's a great, if you're talking about um, ways to sort of implement this, that's a great way to, to create an avenue for interaction because ultimately that's quite a, often quite a passive role for the parents. They're often just listening and taking in the information, but it will, if a the parent then wants to carry that on, the, the coach has almost created that first opportunity by breaking down the, the parent coach divide by immediately engaging the parents and almost saying straight away, you are a part of this environment as well. So I think that's a really good sort of uh, strategy that helps you to, to almost keep gauge that. And, and then those relationships and conversations you're talking about can start to evolve. Yeah. Heather, Jen, have you, have you ever had coaches ask for a bit more input from you? They've, well, it's it's tricky. They, they ask they ask le less about for input, more about for, for actual physical help. Okay. Often, yeah. Um, so it's less technical input on on what the coaching session should be about. Um, so they they do discuss philosophies at the beginning of the season, you know, when a club's reformed and maybe whether, whether their strap line is everyone gets a game, you know, so that you know that type of thing. But certainly it's just usually a cry for help <laughs> rather than informing the session. Yeah, sure. Is that similar to you, Jen? I don't think they've asked for my help on the pitch or anywhere else. Um, it's slightly different because I think when you get to more elite level, it's all, you know, they have so much help and support, you know, nutrition, psychology, the welfare of the athlete is, you know, huge these days. So, um, so not really, mostly it's about accommodating us as parents, you know, traveling to, I don't know, Rio, Tokyo, it's just had one on Tokyo and things around that. So it's more helping us to get there. They do a friends and, a lot of big friends and family things. So um, it, it's slightly different than Heather's where I imagine that, you know, there'd be much more, I'm sure Heather, much more involved than probably I would be. Would you, would you like to be more? Uh, I, I, I don't think I'm qualified to be that much more. Well, involved. not necessarily, you know, I don't expect to go and be a, a, a psychologist <laughs> or a nutritionist, but, you know, to, to be connected with other parents, even if you're in a talent pathway. You know. Well, they do actually. So the parents do, because probably because we're traveling and staying over periods of time, um, and even with friends who's in rugby or going to watch matches, um, you do get to know the the um, they have a friends and family thing, so you do get to know them. So so a kind of community does build up, and then you know we know the parents, we know the uh, the players over many years. So um, so I, I I don't really feel I I need to be any more involved than I am involved, particularly at that level. But um, I do think it is a kind of jigsaw that you know um, I think as Robin was saying, if you if the coach, the parent, the athlete, their friends all linked together that's going to be the best result for all of them if everybody's knowing what everybody is expected to do that's a, a good thing it's all clear then isn't it they're not confused about what what's being asked of them yeah sure um we're just getting to the halfway stage now and, and i've got a page full of notes already scribbled down here so I just try and summarize some of the things that i've heard before we kind of kick off into the second part um one of the early things i think that was discussed that was really important was um what do the children want from the parents? And I think some of that we can probably extend a bit further into if you're stood on the side of a, a picture court, whatever the experience might be, um, it's, it's what do children want from their parents? So some children might want their parents to say nothing, not to do anything. Some children may want their parents to give them advice some may want them to just clap when they do something well um, and not boo when they do something badly but different kids will want different things and it's about probably for us as coaches how we can start to foster those conversations so that again as Robin says the one thing around the environment that we can control we can start to have a bit of input into that I remember uh, I was doing a, a focus group with some young people and we were talking about parents and one one kid said to me uh, when when my mum shouts at me 
it's like a spotlight comes down on me in the middle of the pitch and just shines on me, nobody else. And they said they just didn't want that. So again, it's starting to understand how as coaches, trying to broker those conversations about what, what a kid may want or a child may want from their parents in those different moments. One, one lad in that focus group also said to me that during the game, his mum was on the side of the pitch just going, come on, come on, come on. And he stopped mid game and said, mum, I'm not a horse. <laughs> you know, and, and, but we know that sometimes parents can get a little bit excited and emotional. But again, it's starting to understand what they want from their kids. So that I thought was a really interesting point early on. The timing of when you may or may not have conversations and, and, and Jen referred to it, which was a brilliant piece of advice make sure that there's an agreed time that parents can speak to the coach if they want to speak to the coach and that is most likely not going to be right at the end of a game when there's a lot of emotion whether we've won by a lot or lost by a lot or they have or they haven't played well or not try and establish a time about when that conversation might go on so loads of great stuff in there yeah, uh, just for that first Sorry. half yes Robin. Sorry, just quickly, we've talked a lot about what the children, the athletes want. I think it's also important to balance in there a little bit around what athletes need. And, you know, we are, we do need to bear in mind that, but depending on their involvement in sport, depending on what the outcomes they're looking for are, there may need to be some stuff to help them, you know, develop holistically, but develop as a performer. So things like, you know, using terms like overemphasizing or excessively doing things. So excessively criticizing performance is clearly going to have the detriment effect on motivation, but there may be a point where they do need some constructive criticism given to them to be able to, you know, realistically evaluate their performance and to move forwards. Similarly, with the sort of winning versus not winning culture, depending again where they are, you know, overemphasizing winning clearly at sort of grassroots junior football, for example, is not a positive thing. But at some point, they might need to have a little bit of emphasis on the winning, depending where they are and where they're trying to go. So the, I suppose I think for me it's it's about balancing those wants and needs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, how have you managed to balance those? Because you've you've got a coach's eye on the world as well, and I can imagine you know having watched lots of sports, uh, you know thousands of hours with the kids over the over the time that you have. How do you find that balance as a parent about feedback linked to what Robin has just said there? It's extremely difficult, actually, because as a child, I was extremely competitive myself and I wanted to win all of the time. And clearly they've got some of my DNA in them. So they are actually, you know, they want to win. You know, it's, and I'm, I'm not going to shy away from that, even at grassroots level. They want to have a, a, a to the wire game where it's either a draw, a close win or a, a close lo lose. They don't want a game where you get panned 9-2 every week that type of thing. So it's about looking at what kind of things and environments they're in and, and the league structure is very important. I've realized in my experience of, of a kid's experience in competition, because if the league, league structure is a bit loose or terrible and the wrong teams are playing the wrong teams, it can be actually quite detrimental to their experience. And I think the other thing I think I have, I have actually spoken, I know that my children cannot stand the, the shouters on the sideline, even if it's shouters, shouters of real encouragement. Because what, what I constantly find that I hear on the sideline is, is the term pass all the time. I could probably do a ticker tape counter of how many times I hear that word said. And in my mind, sports and team sports in particular for me, breed decision makers from a very early age. So if somebody's constantly shouting pass, and the child hasn't even received the ball yet. They're not making a decision about what they're going to do with that ball next. They're just following instruction. And there's actually nobody to pass to yet because they haven't developed as players. So this pass, 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 I find really distracting. And I know that my children find really distracting. So I don't actually do that on the sideline. How does that equate to some of your experiences, Jen? Um, well, it's actually funny because in my day job, I actually work at Bristol City um, Football Club, um, and it's and, and I know the FA do a lot around, um, you know, making sure the 
players have a code of conduct, the coaches have a code of conduct, and the um, spectators have a code of conduct. And that's a big drive to explain to parents that they mustn't coach from the sideline. I know at our academy, they actually have a certain distance where parents are put back so that they're not involved in coaching. Um, I'm not sure if that goes on at grassroots, but it doesn't think so. Um, but watching mine, we're too far away for them to hear. And I don't think they care what we shout. <laughs> they like the noise, but um, as long as it's not embarrassing. <laughs> so no criticism of anybody at all, just always positive shouting, you know. Mm, absolutely. So that I think is really important. And and Robin, how, how do you think we can help coaches better get these kind of messages across that, you know, kids don't like being embarrassed. Um, they, they might not want the feedback. So you talked a bit about that kind of early parents meeting start of the year. What are the kind of things that you would say to coaches are important to include in some of those discussions? I think firstly, it's identifying you know, what your context allows you to do. So clearly we've talked about some environments that are highly resourced and, and in, time, in terms of time and finance. And clearly in those you can put in place quite structured you know, sort of engagement processes and have big long, hour long meetings and rooms and TVs and presentations. Now, it wouldn't be appropriate to do that in all environments. And at a grassroots level, that's, that's probably not feasible in terms of the time that the coach has. So I think it's, first of all, it's, it's creating that interaction in a, a way that's manageable for you and your environment and what you're, what you're playing with. So if you're in a grassroots environment and you meet on the pitch, it might be a, a five minute conversation with parents. It just sort of says, this is what we're trying to achieve. This is how we might try and run this. You know, things around sort of coaching philosophies are good because it might prevent parents who, particularly if parents have got experience of the sport and have been involved in that sport as a, as an athlete, either now or at some point in their life, their views of how it should be done can often be big sort of bones of contention between coach and parent, you know, particularly the way that we're evolving how we coach. So just sort of displaying this is how I want to do it and this is why I want to do it can be a really good sort of way of just at least opening parents up to your viewpoint, even if they disagree with that, depending on what knowledge they bring. Um, and just sort of like we talked about, maybe just opening that initial door and saying a bit of transparency well, that's giving a particular time like we've got five minutes at the end of the game or if it's you know if there's a particular period of time where they can come and talk to you in the clubhouse so i might go in my environment off the pitch because i'm a head coach and i've got three coaches working under me and i've spent the whole two hour session in the clubhouse with parents mm. um, and just spent time doing that but my environment allows me to do that and my coaching team allows me to do that so it's sort of really, you know, gauging that and just, I think consistency is key. It's making sure that, you know, don't commit to too much too quickly because your environment might not allow you to do that. And the, the, the parents you're working with may make that harder for you to do. Mm -hmm. and sort of maybe start to, to drip feed it in and, and make points where you're available or have an email address. I think phones are a tricky one because you always pick it up then. You get a text message and they send it at 10 at night, you'll pick it up at 10 at night. If you have an email address, you don't have to look at that email address until a, a particular window of time. So I think working as a coach about what you can and can't commit to is important. Yeah, it's, I think establishing those boundaries, I think, like you just said there, is a really helpful one, especially if Heather's, you know, five gins down by 10 o'clock. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> on a Tuesday, thanks. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, some of those kind of things are challenging. And um, one of my experiences, I think, of, of those kind of parent meetings that I always used to get wrong as a coach was I just used to talk at parents and I'll tell them all of this. And what I was never really good at that I, I started to do as I got a bit more knowledge, I guess, was I'll go into the parent meeting and just say, right, what questions have you got? So rather than just tell parents, this is it, this is it, this is it, be right. Let's, let's talk about the questions that you've got, what kind of things you need to know. And, and we get all sorts from parents about, well, what kind of things should I give them for breakfast? You know, and when should I give them this breakfast? You know, should they have pasta before a game if the morning's a 10 o'clock kickoff? Well, possibly not. But then what we started to do was, was have a much more richer dialogue that was two way as opposed to, you know, this is all about the coaches telling parents those kind of things. So definitely those kind of meetings are really interesting. And, and there's a great question in the box there from Matt that I'm just going to put to, to, the, to you three here. So Matt is a, a, a judo club, which is mostly recreational, but they've got a particular 
uh, child who's on the comp competition pathway, parent very driven. So you've probably got some mixed experiences. And Jen, you may well have had this from, I guess, from your three growing up that have, have probably um, been better than some of the other children they might have been playing with at that stage. Um, how do we help that kind of child parent make sure that they're part of it without feeling like they're getting preferential treatment from everybody there? Gosh, that's a tricky one because mm. uh, I think in, in game sports, hockey and rugby and, um, you know, you've got pathways and you're moving up into different leagues, aren't you? Or you, you move up to the first team. So you always, there's always somewhere to go. So you're playing at the same level to keep competing. If you've got one part in an individual sport, that's much more difficult. I, I, I don't think I can answer that unless it's actually the competition you send them to that, that you identify a different competition for that person. But still, that's difficult. I, I don't know enough about judo to know, could you challenge somebody so that they can progress if they're playing with people not quite as fast, accurate, speedy as them? I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm not really sure. Heather, what do you think? Sorry, I'll just unmute myself. Uh, so yeah, I was just wondering about this in terms of some kind of individual sports. Um, and I think it's probably the environment you set in terms of that uh, recreational judo club. You are going to have some you know, uh, rising stars in there, it's inevitable. Um, it's just how you make sure that you know that everybody within that that setting is on their own journey to get to their better better person bit or higher performance and everybody's everybody's advancing at their own pace. And then this, this one, one star that's probably kind of showing differences, having a higher performance output. It's just about making sure that that parent can actually wrap themselves around their own child in terms of their own development. And maybe there's even things that, that they could try, um, not physically, because judo is obviously a, 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 a higher risk sport, that maybe psychologically or in some other way of mindset around them changing as a, as a, as a participant into a performer, if that's the right language. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that finding that individual challenge is important, but um, I certainly experienced working, even though it was a, 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 a professional football club, so a bit like Jen saying there that, you know, you've got a group of similar kind of talented kids. Um, we have one particular kid who was a real high flyer, probably the most talented 10-year-old kid that I've ever worked with, and, and he was way ahead. But he, he started to get preferential treatment from, from one of the coaches, and we had to sit down with the coach and have the conversation to say, no, that's not how it's going to work. Because the other kids see it. This lad starts to get away with more things than he should do. Uh, and there's all sorts of kind of fractions that start to happen. And, and just making sure that you're consistent with this is the environment. This is what we're trying to achieve. This is the boundaries of behavior, uh, regardless of whether they're really good or not really good. Um, but I think in Matt's case there is, uh, and Gary's actually mentioned that, very clear on this is what we're about. This is what we stand for. We challenge the, um, we'll challenge the, the uh, athletes on an individual basis with different things, but the environment is the same for everybody. Um, Robin, from a coach development perspective, and kind of Greg mentions it here as well, how do we make sure we get some of these messages to coaches to help them? I think there's um, there's also a chance there that maybe we need to try and rephrase the word from preferential to differential, mm. and all sort of, and that that's about you mentioned consistency, but also um, the sort of what you set out with and the way that you do that. If you're clear in your messaging to your parents from the start, it may be that that parent and child seeks that extra support. But as long as you make them aware that there's opportunities to do that, and I think it depends what you're doing. Like you mentioned, talking about. Um, sort of, you know, preferential or favoritism is clearly not, but if it's a developmental involvement and you're pushing a developmental agenda there, then clearly because that athlete and parent is seeking that, that's slightly different to just, you know, letting them get away with things that maybe aren't, other people can't get away with. The definite consistency, but also potentially, you know, making it clear that differentiated learning like we do in the coaching world is differentiated approaches can work with parents as well. Um, in terms of coach education, 
I think it's we've certainly got a, a role in terms of helping to helping coaches at a first point acknowledge and understand that parents are part of the role. I think there's probably still quite a lot of coaches. Not there's a lot of change going on, but there's certainly probably still coaches that perceive that they're not my responsibility. Let's put them over there. So first of all, at that sort of level, there's that change in that perception. But then also giving coaches the tools, like we're talking about here, in terms of sort of strategies that they can use, but making sure they're fit for purpose, not coaching what they can and can't commit to. Because like I said, there's no point saying to all coaches, you should deliver an hour long session telling parents what you're doing. If your environment is on the side of a, a football pitch in the middle of, you know, December, and that's just really not when you've got no indoor facilities. So I think it's, it's sort of encouraging coaches to, engage in reflection around what their environment allows them to do, what their knowledge of, of the sort of impairment approach that actually relationships is and, and building that from the ground upwards so that then they can start to be confident in making sort of decisions about the choices they make about how they engage them. Brilliant. Yeah, great. Thank you. One of the questions that also came up um, earlier on, which I think is uh, it's fairly common, I think, as, as, as children get older, um, is that parents often start to then not watch their kids play. And sometimes, you know, they get to 14, 15, 16. Sometimes the um, young person's expected to get there on their own, or the parents will just drop them off and disappear. Should we expect parents to still be there? Heather, you know, you, you, your kids now, should they still be there? Should they be? And if they're not showing any kind of engagement should the coach try and engage the parents i think um the, the coach will probably need to understand the circumstances of that parent because that parent might have three other children that they need to get to other places at the same time so it's about, i think it's about managing expectations and i know we talk about understanding and connecting with our athletes and participants but i think we need to have an understanding of the other responsibilities sometimes that parents have and maybe they don't have the time to stay at every training session but they commit to every match or game is if there's a difference there you know so maybe on a tuesday night they drop the kid at training but then they've got to take their sister to gymnastics or to drop somebody off at music or take some medicine round to their mother-in-law. You know, there's a whole host of things going in the background that shouldn't be assumed is non-engaged. Um, so it's just about looking, looking at what the levels of engagement are and managing those expectations between the parent and the coach and the child. Mm. How, would you, how would you like a coach to facilitate that conversation? Uh, I don't know. I just think as human beings, just have a conversation, I suppose, in terms of, and as I've said, I mean, my my children have grown up with the coaches around them in a friendship group with their own, you know, friends from school and things. So they kind of know, people know our lives. It's not like we've we've been selected into a squad that's a higher level that we've never met the coach before. So they, you know, we need to, to start again with that relationship. We've actually evolved our relationship since the you know my eldest was four years old so i think there's a slightly different thing for me there rather than being selected into something then you, you, you're kind of starting again on a first date kind of situation mm. so what about you jen and some of your experiences as uh, as yours have made their way through the talent pathway what what are some of the things that you've seen that you thought that, that was really good from a coach engaging with parents um, well, I think it was, it was those organised events, I think, afterwards, but it's um, yeah, it's difficult because I think I, I think that most of the people I've seen that's made it at elite level, the parents are engaged, which makes it a little bit sad to think maybe some drop through the net because the parents aren't engaged. So maybe there's, um, an, um, there's something to look at there. Why do some people stay on a talent path? Just looking at elite performers, because most of the elite performers I've seen or even through my job, the parents, um, even in football where you've got, um, you know, grassroots there, the parents are still very much actively involved all the way through. So do some people drop out because the parents aren't? I, d I don't know. That's another question, is it, to look at. Mm. I think parent engagement is, is 
hugely important, especially I think something where you're training twice a week, like Heather was saying, and what you know, all the I mean, saying training, I, I mean, I wouldn't want to step training, how boring, <laughs> but you know, um, but going to matches and stuff, I'd always be there. But I, yeah, I think there is something there that um, might be difficult for some children if the parents drop off, maybe they drop off, and we're losing people that could have made it. Mm. Robin, have you seen anything in the literature around that kind of um, parent engagement way? Yeah, there is There is a couple of bits and pieces that have come out in the, over the last few years around sort of um, really high performing athletes have had sort of generally parent interaction has been very supportive and sort of um I suppose empowering in a sense um whereas i suppose there's been research that suggested athletes that haven't made it all the way to the top sometimes their parents are maybe been too over the top or too too sort of uh, unavailable in that respect it is there is you know clearly an element of luck in all sort of progression as a as a performer and as have mentioned you know context around you know what's going on away from the sport it might not be that the parent doesn't want to be there, they just can't be there. So, you know, it is it is challenging for all the research, you know, that there's always outliers, athletes that have made it to the top with really heavily involved parents, athletes who have made it to the top with like no parent involvement whatsoever for whatever reason, and athletes in the middle. So, yes, the research suggests, you know, and, and while we talk about parents are key, um, but it's quite a complex relationship to sort of maximise and optimise its impact on on okay brilliant thank you that, that's really interesting as, as we get to this bit now as we're kind of wrapping up towards the end what are the kind of top tips robin that you would you would say right uh, if i was going to talk to a coach or do some development for coaches these these would be my kind of top three things that i think a coach should do or should think about in terms of engaging with parents? So engage with parents from the start, I think, whatever the start looks like, it's always harder if you if you try and bring parents into it halfway through, whether that's a season or a cycle or, a, or an environment. Um, develop an awareness of the parents' existing knowledge and experience, like Heather mentioned and, and Jennifer both mentioned, you know, also what they can and can't commit, and but clearly understanding, you know, are they confident in that environment, particularly if they move into a new environment, what's their experience half of that? Um, and I suppose one of the other, if I was to pick another key one, it'd be to build trust as a coach. And that's all that's not just of the sport, like technical, tactical, physical, because clearly that's important for parents, depending on what environment their child is in, but also that sort of interpersonal level. So trusting you as a, as a coach with your character that they know they can open it conversation with you they know that you will respond to them if they ask a question they know you're approachable i think that's those probably would be the three key ones amongst quite a few but yeah heather what what would you say if you were uh going to talk to a coach what are the three things that you think right you know I, I wish a coach would do this or say this or share this in terms of your perspective as a parent I agree with Robin, actually, and I think it's uh, engage early. Um, and I think it's to a point that I mentioned about managing expectations of of what does what yeah, people's different levels of commitment might look different to different people. Um, and even if I can only drop off and pick up and be on time, to me that's hundred percent commitment. Where if, if a coach might see another parent there's all the time, is there a hundred percent commitment? So it's having an understanding of that. And I think Robin also mentioned trust, and I think that goes both ways. So in terms Oh, I may, may have just lost Heather. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Sorry, Heather, you just broke up a bit then, just before that bit. Yeah, we'll Can put you back. Yeah, I think it's a, it was on Um, and having strap lines that everybody can game, but then they play their best player. Yeah. Breaking breaking up there again, Heather. I think one of the. I'll stop talking. Yeah, I think what you're saying is uh, <laughs> is that consistency. So if somebody says, right, we're going to have equal game time and then doesn't follow it through. Um, 
yeah I've, I've definitely seen that now and you know my one of my best mates is running his son's football team and he's experiencing that himself but he's kind of got himself into the, that exact hole by saying uh yeah everybody will have equal game time and then he hasn't followed that through and i think on the sidelines you get the the chats in amongst the parents that have then picked this up and, and started to question that so Definitely that consistency piece, I think, there that you said, like links to the trust is an important one. Jen, what would your your kind of key things for coaches be? What advice would you give coaches about then engaging with parents? Uh, probably I, I just want something that's a good, you know, good communication lines, um, something that's organised. So communication, organisation and probably fairness, not fairness, just everybody has an equal opportunity, not equal opportunity for outcome, but, you know, the opportunities are there. Those that take them, take them. Those that don't, don't. But give us a, give us a bit more on on good communication. What kind of things does that look like or involve? Well, just on all kinds of things. It might be going right down to grassroots. It's knowing that you know what you're turning up, who's in the team, what you're going to wear to other communications. Might be we're playing this tournament. Um, we're going to Holland. You know, people meet here, do this. So anything, just all the tiny bits of information. So you're not looking to get it. It's coming out or coming at the beginning. So you communicate what you can, even if it's, and it could be other things, communicating what your philosophy is. It could be communicating um, what the standards are for the players, the standards, you know, everything's. So you just understand what's going on. There's no, you know, it's just out there before you look at it. So. Mm. Yeah, great. I think one of the things that 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 covers then and also kind of touches upon one of the points that um that robin made is about starting to know your parents and my experience is now at the moment of uh of grassroots sport and so i'm i'm a coach at a rugby club and i don't know anything about rugby um which is quite helpful to a degree i think um but what they have in rugby is they they speak to the parents and then they share the roles a lot more. So they've found out that there's a couple of parents that, uh, that are keen to take on like a team manager role. So they're just doing the admin and the organization of that, those key bits of communication. So training is this time, and because of lockdown and everything that's happened now, the return to play is all a bit different. So we all have to turn up at this time, we've got this window, but we've got parents that are keen to do that. Um, we also have one parent who's uh, an accountant, which is great because there's your club treasurer. So it, it's it's working out all of those different roles very quickly about what different parents can contribute and not feeling for the coach that they have to do everything on their own. Whereas typically, from my experiences of working in football for a long time, they don't do that. You know, the coach tends to do everything, organise, plan, take the money, like put up the nets, do the lot. And I think the more that we can involve the parents across the whole organization, uh, certainly at grassroots sport, it becomes a lot more of what it seems like Heather experiences, which is a community sports experience. It's not just one coach and a team, it's it's everything. So that, that kind of parents piece that, that you all touched upon there about engaging with people was really useful. Um, I mean, the time has flown by and there are so many different kind of alleyways that we could have explored. But thank you very much for all of your input in the different ways. And what I think this is really useful for is it gives it gives coaches the chance to hear the view of parents that have got kids from grassroots sport all the way through to Olympians uh, and the differences. And, and then having Robin's input from uh, from again from a a coach's perspective, but also somebody that reads a lot in this area is really useful. So thank you very much to uh, all three of you for, for giving up your time. Um, Heather, it's your job, so you had to be here, but, um, <laughs> but uh, 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 thank you very much for uh, for giving up your time, Jen and Robin. It is really, really much appreciated. Okay, checks in the post, is it? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It'll be the same amount that, um, that Robin gets. Uh, so just to finish off, we've got a few slides just to show uh, we're in UK coaching week um, and what we've got is some Instagram live conversations coming up. So we've got three top coaches here and as we get towards the end of, of coaching week, 
we're starting to look a little bit more at some of the elite coaches. So today we've looked at parents and we've done some different things earlier on in the week. So we've got a conversation today with Judy Murray, uh, a fairly well-known sports parent. Uh, again, somebody that's uh, got lots of views about parenting and environments for, for coaching there. Mel Marshall is the coach of Adam Peaty, who has just become a new parent. Uh, so what's that going to look like for Mel? And Mel was on one of the previous Curious Coaches Clubs talking about, well, how does she help Adam as the world's greatest ever swimmer in a particular distance become the greatest parent and the greatest husband and the greatest person? What does that mean for her as a coach, which is a fascinating conversation to have there. And Tony Minicello, mostly known for his experiences with Jessica Ennis Hill. And Tony always got lots of opinions, uh, and I'm sure we'll be more than happy to share them as we get to the end of Coaching Week as well. So feel free to uh, access those on Instagram Live. We're also looking at some research to learn a little bit more about whether you've taken part in some online learning during the last six months of the crazy world that we've been living in. If you have, we'd be really interested to know if you'd be keen to be part of some research. We'd like to know some of your experiences, your views, um, what's worked for you, what hasn't worked for you. So Curious Coaches Club that we've obviously been running for, for what feels like 412 weeks now. Uh, time to learn sessions that we've been running once a month, as well as some of the online safeguarding workshops that we've been delivering, or if your role is developing coaches, again, we'd like to hear from that. So if you're happy to be involved in some of that research, just drop research team at ukcoaching.org a message. And again, we'd love to hear some of your thoughts in there. So we're getting to the end of the, this season of Curious Coaches Club. And as always, you can get your certificate and share your thoughts on there. We're going to have a season finale coming up um, on Monday. And this is going to be all about Rising Phoenix. So it's the Netflix program that is taking place at the moment. You may well have seen it, and it's all about the Paralympics and what is basically an incredible story about how it's developed. Um, Paralympians, some of their stories from uh, a girl that's come through in fencing, some of the athletes, um, Matt Stodman, an archer from US. Uh, and if you haven't seen Rising Phoenix, have a watch of it. And then we've got a session which will be the, the end of season one that will complete the, uh, the, the first of our seasons on Curious Coaches Club. So that's going to be taking place on Monday. So again, booking for that as normal online there. So that's the end for today. Final thank you for me to Jen. Thank you very much. Really good of you to give up your time. Heather, Robin, thanks very much. Um, if the three of you could stay on just to finish off, that would be great. Everybody else, feel free to log off and we'll see you on Monday. Thanks very much. Bye. <laughs>